the next talk that we have is by Dr. Greg Ewald, uh, and Dr. Ewald is the director of the Heart Failure Program uh, at Washington University in St. Louis, and uh, Greg is um, uh, a recognized expert in heart failure, mechanical circulatory support, and transplantation. And we've charged Greg uh, with, with a difficult topic, but I think one that's very relevant to all of us who are outpatient physicians, and that is, uh, what are the appropriate sorts of strategies for uh, outpatient heart failure management? And I've asked him not to spend a lot of time talking about ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and the kinds of routine therapy that I'm sure you're all very well acquainted with, but the question is, is really how can we use some of the other kinds of technologies and services that we have available to us to improve our outpatient heart failure processes and outcomes? So, Greg, thanks a lot for coming to Asheville. I know it wasn't a, an easy trip for you last night, but we appreciate you coming. No, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, so, Joe summarized that nicely. I mean, I, I think that uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time, you know, kind of reviewing the basics of, of heart failure, uh, certainly. Um, I think it still warrants uh, thinking about some of these things, some of the lifestyle modifications and things that probably are more effective than we realize uh, as long as we can get the patients to really uh, focus in on that. Um, but I think what's happening now is that it's, the, the care is really not just in the office. We get a tremendous amount of data now about patients and information about how they're doing um, between office visits. And that'll speak a little bit to, to what Mike was talking about with uh, uh, rehospitalization for heart failure, whether we can utilize this data that we obtain from, from uh, the, the devices and other things that these patients have to try to uh, focus in on that. Just a couple of disclosures. So we, we've already covered this to some extent. I mean, I think uh, just to hit home that, that really there are a tremendous number of patients out there. We, uh, we in heart failure programs uh, do this all the time, but I think uh, all of us that take care of patients in any capacity are going to take care of patients with heart failure. Um, and uh, we're still diagnosing about, about a half a million new cases per year um, with hospitalizations uh, for heart failure being one of the biggest uh, uh, morbidities that they have. And, and Mike touched on that very nicely and how we manage those patients. Um, and we spend a tremendous amount of money with hospital days being a, a big portion of that. So anything we can do to minimize that, uh, as we just talked about, uh, is, is, is warranted. So in general, I mean, I think you know, a lot of this is common sense, but think about the goals of really managing a patient with heart failure. Uh, number one, they want to feel better. They want to actually have better exercise tolerance, want to be able to go on with their day-to-day -day lives and have some quality of life. Um, keeping them out of hos the hospital is obviously an uh, important goal in that regard as well. Um, we've talked a little bit already about how, how high the mortality is in this population, so the evidence-based therapies that we know uh, decrease mortality uh, are, are critical and, and really, I think, uh, again, uh, trying to titrate medical therapy to its, you know, to its uh, optimal dosing uh, is, is paramount in that re regard. Um, because I think if we do those things, we'll actually prevent some of their progression of heart failure, can actually even reverse remodel the ventricle in some of these patients and, and really make a tremendous impact on their ventricular dysfunction if the disease is, is impacted early and, and aggressively. So if you kind of look at the, the comorbidities or some of the other heart, the risk factors for heart failure, and this will also come into play as we talk a little bit about the staging system for heart failure, um, but based on the, the uh, Heart Failure Society uh, practice guidelines, um, again, managing all of these comorbidities aggressively can really have a huge impact. So we're going to talk today about, you know, inpatient stay. We're going to talk in a little while about, uh, you know, very expensive devices and transplants and things, things of that nature. But, but if we can actually impact a lot of these comorbidities early on and aggressively, I think we probably prevent a number of cases of heart failure from ever really getting to that stage. Um, so so th these really make a lot of sense in managing hypertension aggressively um, and really maintaining uh, normotensive blood pressure, uh, managing diabetes and hyperlipidemia aggressively to prevent uh, recurrent ischemic events and ischemic injury. Um, inactivity, uh, really trying to focus in on uh, patients having some degree of uh, aerobic physical activity on a regular basis. And, and this was actually studied recently. Uh, we were involved in HF Action. It was, a, I think, really a landmark trial that was, that was uh, funded by the NIH and, and really won't be repeated again. But 
as, as Mike was talking about large uh, trials and heart failure, this is really one of the big ones. And, and uh, it was, a, I think, very difficult to pull off. Chris O'Connor and the, the group at uh, the DCRI did a fantastic job. But really looking at cardiac rehabilitation and regular exercise training uh, in people with heart failure, number one, is it safe? Can we, can we really recommend exercise to these patients? I still see patients in the office that uh, come to me that um, their cardiologist or their, you know, their primary caregiver has said, oh, you've got heart failure, you need to stop doing everything. And uh, I think that's clearly not the message that we got from HF Action. Um, this was really a, you know, a, a big uh, Im a trial to try to impact. So a number of patients, uh, I think we randomized about 2,300 patients to either exercise training uh, or usual care. Um, and the, the exercise training group went to cardiac rehabilitation for 12 weeks. Uh, they were provided with an exercise bike to put in their home and were told to exercise five times a week uh, up to an hour uh, a, a day when they did exercise. And so you can imagine trying to do a lifestyle intervention uh, as, a, as a therapy in a, in, a, in a clinical trial was difficult. Um, and, and so I think some of the, the success or what you see here in this slide is, is the fact that it was really difficult to get patients to adhere to the therapy, number one. Um, uh, but what we did show is that, um, uh, that, that it really was a safe intervention, uh, that there was not a, an abnormal signal in telling people to exercise. People didn't have uh, uh, issues. Um, and if you actually did some adjustment for uh, some uh, subgroup uh, adjustments, you could actually show that exercise training did have a, an overall favorable effect uh, on uh, hospitalizations. Um, we could not show a difference between mortality between the two groups, um, but really from this trial, I think we can recommend that our patients exercise on a regular basis, uh, again, aerobic exercise uh, up to uh, what they feel they're comfortable doing on a regular basis. But I think more importantly, um, uh, Catherine Flynn uh, presented this sub-study from, from the trial looking at quality of life uh, instruments. And looking at the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, um, you can see that patients in the exercise group uh, actually had an improvement in their overall quality of life. And so I randomized the number of patients into the study, and I can just tell you from the experience at my institution, um, that's what we saw, that patients who actually adhered to the, to the prescription and, and, and really did try to uh, exercise on a regular basis and kept going even after that supervised uh, cardiac rehab stent, uh, really did feel better. Their stamina improved, their exercise times improved. And so I think that you know this is a, a big intervention. It's difficult to maintain, but I think uh, once people really start to do it, they will actually uh, embrace it uh, if it does have uh, clinical benefit for them. So Greg, what, what kind of exercise prescription are you providing? For, for your patients, you know, this is a common problem. I'm sure that everyone in the audience has the same experience. Usually during the first clinic visit for a heart failure, someone will sit down and say, what can I do? What, what do you tell those people about exercise? Yeah, so, and I think from the guidelines and from what we saw in HF Action, I think that um, uh, basically what I tell them to do is, is you know, symptom-limited exercise. And, and I try to follow at least somewhat what we, uh, provide an HF action is to um, is, is try to get them to exercise three to five times a week, uh, do a warm-up period and a cool-down period. If they can't, you know, if they can't do that 45 minutes or so of, of exercise, break it up into two or three sessions a day, and that's what we actually recommended in HF action is that they actually try to reach that goal of an hour, but it doesn't have to be all at once. It can be 10 or 15 minutes, take a break, come back and do some more later. Uh, and, and really just low-level aerobic exercise, walking, using a treadmill, using a stationary bike, walking in a pool or getting in a pool is, is obviously very good exercise. A lot of patients will ask you about using weight training. Um, again, I think low, low uh, more resistance training with uh, low levels of weight um, and uh, really staying away from the, the heavier weight lifting, you know, seems to be effective, and that's kind of what we did in uh, HF Action. So, so I think to, you know, to then move on to some of the rest of the uh, treatment goals, basically, again, weight reduction uh, is, is important, and uh, I think uh, 
you know, a lot of successful heart failure programs will have a dietitian uh, attached to the program, and I think getting patients into the dietitian early in, early after diagnosis uh, is very important in trying to uh, uh, affect not only weight reduction but also uh, dietary sodium and, and volume uh, habits and restrictions that are that are effective. Um, alcohol use uh, again, trying to uh, decrease alcohol use. I saw a guy in the office yesterday who was drinking heavily. Uh, his ejection fraction was 15%, and four months later, he's drinking less heavily. Uh, he hasn't abstained, um, uh, but he was proud of the fact that he was only drinking three to six beers a day. Um, but his ejection fraction was 40% now on, on low-dose low medical therapy and, and, and a reduction in his alcohol intake. So that can actually have a, a, a very significant effect. And then smoking cessation, you know, is, is paramount to all the things that we take care of, really. So I think that the hard part is really putting all this into play. I mean, it takes a lot of time in the office to do this education, to do this. I think that's why having a, a ancillary staff that help with some of these things is important. Um, but a lot of patients really want to come in. They want you to, you know, write a prescription that's going to take care of everything, not really realizing how, uh, how effective they can really be at, at, you know, taking ownership of their own health care and really making a difference. Sometimes uh, just a matter of the, the sodium and fluid restriction, uh, if patients really buy into that, uh, can have a significant impact. We were talking about diuretic resistance. Well, a lot of it is just uh, more, too much sodium, too much fluid intake that uh, you just cannot uh, manage with uh, higher dose diuretics. So I'm sure you're all familiar that the guidelines for uh, managing heart failure and the staging system has been around now for some time. And, and uh, I think the important take-home messages here really are that, uh, again, heart failure is not all stage uh, C heart failure. Not there, it's not all the, the, the symptomatic patient that we, you know, are talking about with uh, acute decompensated heart failure and some of the other things we're going to talk about today. Really, we, we want to intervene up here. We really want to uh, manage the comorbidities aggressively. Um, in patients with uh, asymptomatic uh, LV dysfunction, I think we want to still be aggressive with medical therapy, and that's really what the guidelines will recommend. So again, uh, we've already talked a little bit about uh, the patient at high risk for heart failure. I think managing uh, hypertension with things like ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers or beta blockers are going to be more effective than some of our other choices if we're sort of thinking about neurohormonal activation and, and blocking those effects as it uh, relates to progressing down the pathway of heart failure. Um, again, asymptomatic LV dysfunction, if you're asked to see the patient who had an echocardiogram for some reason, uh, preoperatively or otherwise, and they've been shown to have uh, LV dysfunction that has not yet manifested a lot of symptoms, I think those patients you know, still re require a lot of close clinical follow-up and really should probably be on an ACE inhibitor and beta blocker uh, really in the absence of significant hypertension. So they really ought to be treated with drugs that we know can have a reverse remodeling effect uh, on the ventricle. Um, in terms of the symptomatic patient, uh, again, uh, all of the same therapies apply. ACE inhibitor, beta blocker are, are key, and, and really I think the other key there is really titrating those drugs to you know, near doses that we know are effective from clinical trials. I still see a lot of patients that, uh, you know, the, the success has been just to get them on an ACE and a beta blocker, but I think then trying to move that dose a, a bit higher uh, over the course of uh, s uh, several visits uh, is, is important. Um, ancillary therapies like aldosterone antagonists uh, in, in the sicker patients, um, uh, digoxin still probably has a role in, in some patients, those with atrial fibrillation. Um, hydralazine nitrates in the African-American population have, have been effective and should be thought of as, as uh, adjunctive therapy. We've, I think you've already talked uh, in, earlier in the conference about uh, indications for a defibrillator or uh, by the pacing uh, device. And Dr. Starling, I think, is going to talk about the refractory patients, uh, when to think about things like mechanical circulatory support uh, and transplant. So, you know, I, I still think uh, why our patients fail, and, and Mike touched on this uh, significantly with uh, hospitalization and rehospitalization, again, is compliance issues, uh, both you know, medications as well as uh, sodium and fluid restriction, um, inappropriate medical therapies at times. I saw in the guy in the office yesterday who got hospitalized uh, uh, because he was taking high-dose non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for a knee injury. 
um, developed some acute renal failure and, and volume overload and had to be hospitalized. So I still think, you know, being, being careful about uh, other agents is, is important. Um, lack of access to follow-up, and we'll talk about maybe some ways to intervene there in, in terms of some of our device patients um, uh, in a minute. And, and again, education, I think, about heart failure. And, and that's the thing, uh, you know, as, as Joe was talking about, we, have, we see patients less time in the hospital now. Um, we also see them uh, uh, less time in the office as we're being, you know, forced to see uh, or, or pressured to see more and more patients. And, and uh, I think uh, that's one of the things that tends to fall out of the equation. If you look at uh, the, the effect of education, I mean, it can be significant. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, if patients, uh, it, it's a little bit uh, disconcerting to see that uh, uh, non-compliance rate, even when they listen to our advice, uh, is, is that high uh, in terms of uh, activity. We've already talked about that. Uh, activity uh, is one of the worst ones. Um, and if they don't recall our device, uh, advice to, to them in the office, they're really not going to follow our recommendations, obviously. So, so I think it does uh, benefit to spend a little bit of time with the, certainly the initial patient to try to uh, hammer home some of this, uh, both from a physician standpoint um, and then uh, your, your nurse uh, support uh, to kind of continue to uh, re reiterate uh, all of these things. And I think that's, I mean, I think most successful heart failure programs uh, would you know, really do function uh, with nurse-driven uh, care. I mean, I think that uh, our nurse coordinators and nurse practitioners in our program are invaluable uh, in managing, helping to manage this kind of growing patient population that we take care of. I think the things that they do extremely well um, are really trying to coordinate care for these complex patients. I mean, the, the, pa the heart failure patient has, you know, two or three or four different doctors. They have an electrophysiologist. They have a heart failure person. They have a primary care doctor. Then they have another cardiologist involved. And, and many times they get, you know, almost sometimes uh, conflicting uh, uh, advice from, from different office visits. And, and so we make our nurse coordinators uh, very uh, accessible to the patients. And I think that they kind of, you know, become sometimes uh, that person that really tries to facilitate, you know, sorting all of this out. And then, uh, you know, educating the patient. Every phone call they take and every phone discussion is probably a little bit of patient education involved. Um, and I think the other thing that really uh, they do very well, or my nurse does very well, is, is really optimizing the medical therapy between office visits. So we use, you know, we ask all the patients to get a home blood pressure cuff, measure blood pressure, and, and surprisingly, a lot of patients are very compliant with that recommendation. And, and then call the office. Call us once a week or every other week and, and, and titrate the, the carvedilol or the metoprolol or the ACE inhibitor uh, really aggressively between those office visits. I mean, don't wait three months or whatever to uh, to go up the, go up on the dose of the medication. So we try to really get them in the office, start that titration process that's really done mostly by the nurses. Um, and, and, you know, do, does having a nurse coordinator involved decrease uh, uh, hospitalization for heart failure? I, I think there is some evidence to support that. So there's this sort of long history of disease management trials that have been done and a lot of those are really done by, you know, a physician, but also really a, a nurse-directed uh, team that uh, uh, gets involved with the patient. Many times there's a social worker or a pharmacist involved. Um, but you can see the, uh, the number of trials done over the last, you know, a lot of these were done in the 80s, uh, mid-90s. Um, Mike Rich at our institution uh, has uh, been involved in that uh, area, arena. And in general, you can show a, a, a reduction in, in admissions to the hospital. What hasn't been so apparent is a cost savings here. So you, you, know, you, you load up the, the cost on the front end of hiring nurses to manage these people as outpatients, um, and then, you, know, and then you, you really don't save as much in the overall total care of the patient. But, but I think still most people would say it improves their quality of life to stay out of the hospital. And I think where we're sort of going to some extent is, is you know, how do we manage, how do we monitor for congestion in the outpatient setting? And, and uh, uh, so rather than, you know, waiting for patients to call us and, and complain that they might be volume overloaded, um, that we're really getting an, a lot of data now uh, from implanted devices uh, uh, between office visits. And I think this is going to be an interesting arena about where do we, how do we use this data? Um, is it really effective? Um, you know, is it only going to increase our workload? 
so how to, how to really incorporate this into day-to-day -day practice, I think, is going to be something that we work on uh, over time, and I'll, I'll show you some, in, some information about that. Uh, Mike's already touched on, you know, natriuretic peptides and, and giving us some idea, but obviously it requires a, a blood draw. Um, will those be sort of point of care at home? Potentially, I think there's some potential for that. Um, daily weights and symptoms have been sort of the gold standard over time. And for people that do it on a regular basis, it probably does have some, some uh, utility, um, but uh, it may not be the, uh, the only way to uh, monitor congestion at home. So there is a kind of a, you know, a literature surrounding uh, telemonitoring. And so trying to uh, get data from the patient uh, between hospitalizations and between visits. And I think, you know, what you see here is that uh, the, the studies, uh, as compared to some of the studies that Mike was talking about, these are very small numbers of patients. You know, uh, these programs are hard to put in place sometimes, uh, small numbers of patients. Um, uh, Follow-up has been somewhat limited. Uh, the TENS uh, HMS, John Cleland's trial, you know, followed people for almost a year and a half, but, uh, but, but it's, you know, it's been something that's been sort of a short-term uh, approach to these patients. And most of the time, it's, again, a nurse uh, coordinator involvement. Um, patients then transmit data back to the heart failure center or the nurse uh, via some uh, uh, device at home that can track weight, can track symptom scores, um, and patients then are sort of flagged as being at risk for coming back uh, to the hospital or being readmitted. And uh, those are the patients then that you, your nurse coordinator needs to focus uh, a more substantial amount of time on. And you can see that there's been a reduction in ho hospitalization, but kind of an inconsistent number of, kind of an inconsistent set of results. Uh, overall, hospital days haven't changed so much in these patients. Uh, uh, even though you might decrease the number of hospitalizations, the number of days in the hospital might be similar. Um, there has been a little bit of a signal towards a decrease in overall mortality. But I think kind of based on what we know, we still don't really know how effective these programs are and, and, and importantly how cost effective they are. Um, and, uh, but, but patients really do sort of embrace this. They, they uh, have pretty good compliance with, with using these devices. Again, I think the effects on hospitalization uh, readmission rates and costs are somewhat inconsistent. Um, and so I think that, you know, we still need more data in this arena. And there is actually a large uh, NIH-sponsored trial going on looking at home telemonitoring. Uh, Harlan Crumholz uh, is the principal investigator of the TeleHF study. And uh, so the NIH has put money behind this, and it's a large trial that I think will answer a lot of these questions as compared to a lot of the smaller studies I showed you on that uh, summary slide. Randomized trial, patients are either randomized to the TeleHF, and it's basically a simple uh, telephonic interface. The patient uh, gets on the telephone, they uh, go through a series of steps and key in information about their weight, uh, their uh, well-being and symptoms uh, to a system. That gets uploaded to a uh, internet-based uh, uh, interface that your nurse coordinator or anybody can get on and look at and sort of flags patients uh, uh, when they may actually need uh, a outbound call from the heart failure center or the center. So um, the, the trial is, is hopefully powered to look at uh, all-cause readmission to the hospital and mortality. Um, and obviously there can be a number of secondary outcomes uh, explored, including you know, whether it's cost effective, uh, how patients, how satisfied are patients and sort of overall health status. Um, so the enrollment was actually uh, completed uh, last summer. Um, uh, patients uh, completed their uh, uh, follow-up period uh, in late March, and so the data are being analyzed uh, now, and hopefully we'll be hearing something about telehf uh, in the relatively uh, near future in terms of using sort of a, a more aggressive home monitoring. Greg, I think that you've, you've highlighted very nicely some of the um, tools and techniques that are, are available. Um, and I think that we've all been engaged in some of these trials, and I think the people at least sitting on this stage are fortunate enough to be at institutions who, that are heavily invested in management of heart failure. And I suspect that a lot of the people here um, don't have that same kind of support in their office practices and potentially even in their, the hospitals that they practice in. And can you give us a little bit of insight about the availability of these kinds of approaches uh, for the rest of the people that are here in the audience? Is this something that you can 
um, you know, you can you could contract and use the services of some of these um, these technologies that you've described. Yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see what TeleHF shows because I think that's a fairly simple system. And uh, but again, I think you're right. Uh, there sort of has to be uh, some buy-in from more than just the physician's office. I mean, it's unless I think you manage a large number of patients and and, and, and are at some risk of hospi- you know, taking a uh, issue with hospitalization, then it may not necessarily add, add uh, monetary value to your practice. Uh, certainly, your patients may do better, and if that that may be a side, you know, a, an issue that you you uh, welcome there, but. But I think what we're going to see is if, if trials like this can really show uh, cost effectiveness and a significant impact on rehospitalizations, and this can be sustained over a period of time rather than these short-term trials, what will happen, I think, are some of the health plans and others, even you know Medicare, Medicaid, will actually start to use this system, and, and we will be the end users, but they will actually pay for it because it keeps their members out of the hospital. So. Uh, you know, there, I think you probably, a lot of us take care of patients where you get, I get some kind of, you know, phantom fax that comes in from uh, a, uh, you know, disease management uh, program uh, from an insurance uh, provider that I didn't even know my patient was enrolled in. I think right now the, uh, you know, the landscape is really kind of disjointed in terms of using this kind of technology. And so I think trials like this may actually start to clarify that a little bit and, and decide who pays for it. So I think the other opportunity that we have is, uh, you know, is that uh, a lot of these patients now are walking around with implanted devices, and, and I'm sure those patient, those uh, devices uh, prevent uh, sudden cardiac death. But uh, as we've gone further and, and the technology has evolved, uh, those devices now can also feed back some information that can treat heart failure in terms of cardiac resynchronization, but also can feed back some information about how the patient's doing, and uh, and, uh, and I think that's going to be something that we're all going to have to start to really utilize and, and learn how to uh, use in our practices. So the, the you know the with the, some of the clinical trials that were done in the last 10 years to really prove that uh, defibrillators uh, improve mortality in patients with both non-ischemic and ischemic uh, heart failure. Uh, number of these patients now are, are appropriately being implanted with ICDs and, and have those uh, uh, there. Um, that's also created a burden, I think, you know, your institution probably has seen the same thing, but uh, created a burden on taking care of these devices. And, and uh, the electrophysiology community uh, was really, uh, you know, first to uh, embrace kind of remote monitoring and trying to, as the technology and the ICDs and devices have improved, we can actually now check the device, monitor the device uh, in a more robust way, um, and uh, really do that without the patient having to make a trip into the office to get uh, a device check. And, and so there have been a number of uh, studies. I think there was just another uh, study published uh, in circulation this past week to really look at is that a safe and effective way to take care of patients, to monitor this defibrillator without seeing them in the office on a regular basis. And uh, the CONNECT trial kind of uh, looked at you know, uh, what, what it, are there advantages to actually doing some remote notification uh, instead of waiting till the patient comes in for sort of a quarterly uh, device check? And basically, um, uh, without going into a lot of details, but what, what we've seen is that, you know, you can really diminish or decrease that sort of time to uh, finding out that there's been a clinical event um, and, and acting on that clinical event in a relatively short period of time. And this clinical event doesn't always have to be an ICD shock uh, for VT. It can, be, uh, it can be notification that the patient's gone into atrial fibrillation or, uh, you know, notification that their device isn't functioning properly, uh, uh, that they've got a lead problem. So uh, we've kind of really actually improved our ability to diagnose these uh, problems and act on them much, much more quickly uh, as uh, we've gone to a remote monitoring strategy. But not just managing the arrhythmia part of a device, uh, there's, not, there's other information that we can uh, get from these devices. We can actually, with the accelerometer in a device, we can uh, oversee and look at, see how, uh, see how active the patient is on a day-to-day basis. You can get some idea about how much activity, physical activity your patient's doing. 
Um, there's a lot of data surrounding thoracic impedance and, and uh, uh, lung water and how that uh, may a, a affect uh, hospitalizations and, and decompensated heart failure. We can now get a lot more information about how often the patients are in atrial arrhythmias and whether you decide to anticoagulate those patients or manage them differently based on that. Um, with add-on uh, systems, you can also, through the device and through the home-based device, report back weight, heart rate, blood pressure, symptoms uh, uh, on a regular basis to the heart failure center. So I think there's a number of things that we can actually, uh, as heart failure uh, physicians and specialists and, and primary care physicians, take from this uh, other than just the uh, EP or uh, rhythm part of the defibrillator. So thoracic impedance uh, has been, uh, these devices can actually measure uh, impedance between the generator part of the device uh, that sits in the upper chest and the leads that are in the heart. Um, and uh, uh, impedance across that uh, space uh, decreases as fluid accumulates in the, in the thoracic uh, cavity. And so uh, as the patients become more volume overloaded, presumably uh, impedance goes down and you can actually report this value back in a filtered way uh, back to the uh, center. So uh, w one device uh, calls this Optival and uh, essentially uh, after the device goes in, there's sort of a baseline finding period of about 30 to 40 days. Um, and then the patients are kind of tracked on a regular basis. And as they decompensate, uh, impedance goes down and the device will give you what's called an Optival fluid index. You can arbitrarily set that. You can program that threshold to then pick up when that patient crosses the threshold and you can kind of get some sense that maybe they're actually uh, having decompensated heart failure. There have been some studies to look at that, although relatively small at this point. Um, so the FAST trial was a trial looking at only 156 subjects uh, in a number of centers, um, but they basically got daily uh, intrathoracic impedance measures uh, blinded on patients. Uh, these patients were also uh, uh, recording daily weights in a diary. And the sensitivity for heart failure events um, were looked at within 30 days of a uh, uh, index uh, threshold crossing or acute weight gain. And you can see here that in the patients where we were monitoring uh, intrathoracic impedance um, that uh, you, the sensitivity was very good um, with, you know, what we're going to have to deal with here is these sort of unexplained detections. So sometimes these uh, values change without the patient really manifesting that as a as a definite symptomatic uh, heart failure event. Maybe it was a little bit subclinical, but, but it wasn't really something that we needed to have an action on. Um, so we're going to have to sort of figure out what's the threat, where's the threshold. We want to pick up as many of these events as possible, but we also don't want to have to be uh, talking to and, and querying and tracking down the patients when there's really nothing of, of clinical significance going on. And so that's going to be the challenge to sort of uh, uh, look at this. You don't want to have to be getting a number of uh, alerts to your office every day for your uh, device patients that you have to call them and find out what's going on with their heart failure. As compared with the patients just following their daily weights, you can see weight uh, had uh, a, mod a very modest sensitivity and even tracking weight on a daily basis, as you know, uh, doesn't always uh, predict uh, whether that's all volume overload or not. Similarly, uh, I've been involved in a trial looking uh, at uh, a similar uh, device in, in, with a latitude remote monitoring system. This system gives some information from the defibrillator, but also has a uh, setup where you can actually transmit the weight data uh, symptom scores on a regular basis. And so we randomized about 700 patients uh, over in, in 48 centers. Um, and they remained enrolled in the, in the study for two years. What we did is we took this data. We had a group of patients that were sequestered into a development group. So once we had enough uh, information, we then tried to look at all of the information coming back from the defibrillator and see if we could uh, set up an algorithm, a mathematical algorithm, that would then predict a decompensation for heart failure within 14 to 28 days. And then the test group, the patients that were in the, a group uh, separated from that uh, uh, group of patients, that the algorithm was tested on the test group data uh, to see if we actually could do what we uh, set out to, to uh, perform. And you can see that it's a fairly uh, you know, typical heart failure population uh, in both the development set and, 
evaluation set. There really weren't any significant differences between the groups. Um, they were uh, really on, you know, optimal medical therapy. Uh, over 90% were on beta blockers, and and uh, about 80-85% uh, were on either an ACE or an ARB uh, for their uh, heart failure. So well treated. Ejection fractions were in the mid 20s uh, in general. These patients were uh, CRTD patients. Um, and really, what kind of fell out of the different uh, groups that uh, is that we saw some some difference in signal between the development set and the evaluation set on impe lead impedance. But these were the value. These were the things that seemed to uh, predict uh, some degree of uh, heart failure. So the algorithm uh, included uh, impedance in the RV lead, the shock lead. Um, and uh, the only symptom uh, that really came out in the uh, mix was that uh, uh, sort of the orthopnea question, you know, how many pillows are you sleeping on, uh, kind of came out as something that might predict uh, 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 heart failure decompensation. And so, you know, again, very much like what you saw with that slide looking at the, the FAST data, um, we had about uh, a 60 percent sensitivity for picking up heart failure decompensation um, with two false detections per year. Um, when applied to the evaluation set, uh, it wasn't quite as robust, um, which was somewhat interesting. We still don't really understand why there was a, 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 variety, a difference between the two groups of patients. Um, but again, I think that, uh, you know, so we need to really hone in and, and figure out how we're going to uh, utilize these type systems in monitoring patients uh, between hospitalizations and between visits. So just to touch on some things that are coming around the corner, uh, implantable monitors. So there are systems now to implant in, in, in the heart, uh, in the circulation to measure uh, pressure and to see if that actually, if we can look at uh, actual intracardiac pressures uh, between visits and, and hospitalizations to see if we can actually uh, again, detect a heart failure, but also maybe use those uh, pressures to help us optimize drug regimens and drug therapies. Um, so that is, is something that's being explored actively now. The Compass HF trial looked at the Chronicle device, and this device has been around for some time. Uh, it was a, a standalone implant uh, that measured pressure in the RV outflow tract and then transmitted that data back uh, uh, to the center. Um, and this was a, a a group of about 275 patients in about 30 heart failure centers. Again, a fairly sick group of patients, so the hospitalization rates were relatively high. And to see if, these, if this, uh, giving us this data could actually have an impact. And what we saw in this trial was that there was a reduction in heart failure related events, hospitalizations, unscheduled visits, uh, IV therapies, uh, ER visits, um, but it did not reach, quite reach statistical significance. So based on that, the FDA did not approve the standalone implant uh, as a uh, potential monitoring system for heart failure. But now this uh, sensor in the RV outflow tract has been applied to a defibrillator lead, and that has actually been explored to some extent to see if this uh, information can actually uh, render, uh, render some useful data. The other thing that uh, people are starting to focus in on are measuring pulmonary artery pressures. And uh, uh, so there are now uh, small sensors, this one by CardioMEMS being the one that was most recently reported, a very small sensor that can be uh, uh, put into a distal pulmonary artery, uh, very much like doing, a, you actually put in a, a pulmonary artery catheter, do a Swan-Gans catheterization, and then uh, over a wire put a, a delivery catheter in and deliver this very small sensor to the uh, distal PA, and then patients lay down on a mat every day. Uh, that actually powers up the device, interrogates it, get, generates pulmonary artery pressure waveforms, um, and actually will send that information wherever you want it. You get it to your BlackBerry, wherever you want it. Um, so you can actually get some you know, real-time information about what's going on with patients. But what seemed to be even more important was sort of the trends, you know, using the data over time to try to optimize their meds and, uh, and look for signs of congestion. Other devices are, are similar. This is another uh, sensor on a uh, nitinol uh, stent that actually goes into sort of the main pulmonary artery, and that uh, is in uh, clinical development as well. So the COMPASS trial was just reported uh, by Bill Abraham at the, at the European Society of Cardiology, and uh, they basically used this uh, PA pressure sensor-guided uh, therapy in half the patients and standard medical therapy in the other half 
uh, over a six-month uh, follow-up uh, period initially and then uh, kept uh, some of those patients out to 15 months. And you can see that they were actually able to show a reduction in heart failure hospitalizations uh, in the pressure-guided uh, therapy group. Uh, it was a 30% reduction uh, that was statistically significant. And overall, heart failure hospitaliza hospitalization as an annualized number uh, you, uh, was also reduced. So again, it looks like man monitoring this not only helps manage the patient effectively medically, uh, but may also tip us off to the, the patient who is uh, developing uh, decompensations. There's actually a left atrial pressure sensor in development. This even gets a little bit more invasive. It does require a, a uh, transeptal puncture, and the device sits right up against the uh, left atrial wall. It appears to be safe with uh, uh, you know, a very low or almost zero risk of uh, embolization. It actually gets somewhat endothelialized in the left atrium. Um, and uh, then can transmit back uh, information about true left atrial pressure, which we think is, is a pressure that correlates with uh, uh, how the patient's feeling. Uh, it can actually send it to a handheld device that the patient can use, and this can be programmed then to give that patient some uh, instructions about what to do with their diuretic regimen based on what's going on. So you can actually maybe even push the data back to the patient, uh, have them do a lot of this management, which would be a very, I think, attractive way to do this. I think we're going to have to be careful, though, as we get more and more of these devices. We're going to have patients with uh, uh, hardware and wires running all over the chest, and uh, that creates some issues of its own over, over time. And in the homeostasis trial, a small trial looking at this left atrial pr pressure sensor, uh, initially, um, patients were uh, compared to a historical control. So in the one-year period before they got enrolled in the trial, they had about a 1.4 uh, hospitalizations, this is not a percent, but at one, I think 1.4 hospitalizations per year. Um, in the first three months after their enrollment, they weren't actively managed, uh, but uh, you can see just getting into a clinical trial and uh, being a little bit more cognizant of their uh, heart failure, they actually had a reduction, a significant reduction in their hospital hospitalization rate. Um, and then after three months of active management using the left atrial pressure sensor, uh, that went down even more significantly. So uh, it appears to be something that we need to look at uh, uh, more, uh, more in, uh, in depth. So just to conclude, I think, again, lifestyle modification, education, optimal heart fa failure therapy, uh, you know, despite all of the, the tools and devices we have, they still remain the cornerstone of heart failure therapy. I think having nurse coordinators that focus or help us focus in on these patients uh, are extremely helpful. Um, remote monitoring, I think, is really evolving quickly and, and is going to uh, have effectiveness and, and but, but also may increase the complexity of how we take care of these patients uh, in an office-based setting. Um, and uh, I think, again, additional studies are needed and, and are in progress to clarify the, remote, the role of some of the remote heart failure care uh, that I touched on uh, already. So uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Greg.